In this part uh, of the lecture, we are going to start from the definition of the strain energy function, which is strain energy premium volume, which defines the material, and derive some uh, properties of the stress strain relationship. And um, after that, we're going to discuss uh, special cases which are important in practice. So we are essentially discussing the stress strain relation. This is sometimes called the constitutive law. or relation. And for linear materials, it's called generalized Hooke's law. And for isotropic material, it's Hooke's law, more or less. So how does it work? We, we, what we have discussed previously in the previous part is that if the work done by internal forces is such that it is derivable from a potential, which means that the internal forces are conservative, then we can write the stress to be the derivative of the strain energy function at C with respect to the strain. So what can we deduce from this? The first thing to deduce goes as follows. Let's say that sigma x is the derivative of C with respect to epsilon x and sigma y is the derivative of C with respect to epsilon y. If we derive the first relation here with respect to epsilon y, we get partial sigma x partial epsilon y is the second derivative with respect to c, one time with respect to epsilon x, followed by one time with respect to epsilon y. Then we can do the same for the second equation to get the derivative of sigma y with respect to epsilon x. And this will be the second derivative of C with respect to first with respect to epsilon y, then with respect to epsilon. We know from calculus that the order of differentiation is not important, assuming all derivatives are exist and are continuous, which is let's say the simplest case that we always assume that all functions are differentiable as many times as we like. So these two are equal. And from there, we can conclude that partial sigma x partial epsilon y is equal to partial sigma y partial epsilon x. And the same we can do between any two pairs of stresses and strains, sigma x and sigma z and epsilon z and epsilon x, y and z, or also with respect to shear strain. So what this means is that the increment in stress due to the increment of sigma x due to a small change in epsilon y is the same as the increment in sigma y due to a small change that's right. So what this says is that if you are trying to measure the stress strain relationship of the material by applying strain and measuring the stresses or applying stresses and measuring strain, you can always check if there is a stored energy function by checking relationships of, of this type. 
So the relationship between stress and strain now is not absolutely arbitrary. It cannot be any function. It has to be such that such relations are satisfied at all times. Okay. So now let us consider a material where at zero strain the stresses are zero. So of the undeformed material, initial stresses are zero. So material without any initial stress. So if the initial stress is zero, which is kind of the case that we almost always try to stick to, at least in this course, that's what we're going to do. Then we know that the derivative of t with respect to epsilon x at zero strains, all strains equal zero, which is the undeformed configuration, is sigma x at the undeformed configuration, which is zero. And similarly, you have partial of C, partial epsilon y at zero strain is zero, and there will be four more zeros to write. So all derivatives of a T with respect to all stresses and all strains, uh, sorry, with respect to all strains uh, are equal to zero. That's very good. The other thing that's good to note is that since the relationship between stress and strain is given by the derivative of the stored energy function, the stored energy function is unique up to a constant. So if you add a constant like 1 or 2 or minus 1,000 to the strain energy function, nothing changes and the relationship between stress and strain remains exactly the same. And as such, we can always assume that the value of the strain energy function at the point epsilon equals zero is zero. So what this means is that we have the function which is zero at zero strain and all its derivatives are also zero at zero strain. So the other thing we know is that we are really interested in the response of materials when the strains are small, because this is the range in which most engineering structures operate. So it is quite tempting to expand the strain energy function in a Taylor series around your strain. So we can write that C of epsilon is C of zero plus partial at C partial epsilon at epsilon equals zero transpose times epsilon plus the next term in Taylor series expansion is going to be one half epsilon transpose the matrix of second derivatives of the C with respect to strains at zero, which we are going to call C. And this is a symmetric matrix because it's a matrix of second derivatives. And partial at C, partial epsilon x, epsilon y equals partial two at C, partial epsilon y, partial epsilon x times epsilon plus higher order terms, which are cubic and more. We know that this is zero vector because we assume zero initial stresses. And this is zero by convention. And it doesn't make a lot of difference anyway. So if we can neglect the higher order terms here, then we end up with 
the strain energy functional function to be approximately equal to where C is the six by six symmetric matrix. C is called the material stiffness matrix and sometimes it's called elasticity matrix. And as far as materials which we can assume that they behave in the small string regime, C is constant since they are the second derivatives evaluated at zero. And these constants are all what we need to characterize material response. If we take the derivative of C with respect to epsilon, we find that stress is nothing other than C and epsilon. So C is the matrix of proportionality between stresses and, and strains. And as such, we would have a linear strain stress or stress strain relationship. Okay. So what are other possible properties of C? Since the string energy function is a quadratic, if we assume that the stored energy due to the application of strain to the material is always positive in the sense that if you strain a material, you are always putting energy into the material, you are not withdrawing energy from the material, then we know that if C is always greater than zero, for epsilon greater than zero. Oh, sorry, for epsilon not equal to zero. Because for any strain, whether it's tensile or compressive, it's the same thing. not equal to zero. And this is exactly the definition of a positive definite matrix. So this means that C is symmetric and positive definite. Remember that positive definite is a matter of inequality not a matter of equality. So being symmetric reduces the number of independent components in the most general case to 21 elasticities. Since a symmetric 6 by 6 matrix will have independent, 21 independent components. But positive definite doesn't reduce this number any further but it constrains the range of values that these 21 values may take. All right, so can we simplify further? Well, we can, but we have to assume special material behavior. And the first and most common special material behavior people assume is what we call isotropic 
We assume an isotropic material. The concept of isotropy is very simple. We know that stress is a tensor. And we know that strain is a tensor. So if stress is, if we rotate the axis by an angle theta in the plane or by two angles in, or three angles in CD, then we will have a change in the components of stress. So essentially, the stress in the original coordinate system should be written as some transformation matrix times the stress in the new coordinate system. And this transformation matrix would depend on the rotation between the two sets of axes. And the same, so let us call this T sigma because this is the matrix of transformation of stress. The same will apply for strain, that strain will have the form of T epsilon epsilon prime, where sigma prime and epsilon prime are stresses and strains in the rotated axis and sigma and epsilon are in the original axis. So, if the relationship between stress and strain in the original set of axes was represented by a matrix of coefficient C, if we substitute for sigma and epsilon from the stress and strain transformation relation, we will obtain T sigma times sigma prime equals C times T epsilon times epsilon prime. pre multiplying with T sigma inverse, we can find here that sigma prime equals And this leads us to the conclusion that C prime, which is the elasticity or the stiffness or material stiffness coefficients as it would be measured in the new rotated coordinate system, will be equal to T sigma inverse C T F. Note that T sigma and T epsilon are six by six matrices, so they are not rotation matrices. They can be derived from rotation matrices, but they are not themselves rotation matrices because right now we are dealing with stress and strain in the form of six by one vectors, not in the form of three by three uh, tensors. This is very good, but what this says is that the components of C prime will depend on the coordinate system we have. So if we have a piece of material like this, and we measure the stress-strain relationship in, let's say, a coordinate system like this, we are going to get certain value for the coefficients of C. If we measure them, In this coordinate system, we are going to get a different set of coefficients C prime, and they are related by this equation here. And the coefficients will not remain C. An isotropic material, on the other hand, satisfies the condition that C prime equals C. So the relationship between stress and strain is the same in any coordinate system, no matter how much we might rotate. And this imposes a lot of constraints on 
the possible values of the 21 constants that appear in the constitutive relation. Of course, now because of this condition here, which is condition for isotropy, Because of this condition, we know that these 21 coefficients are always the same. So if we don't have to worry about which coordinate system we're using in order to measure material properties because we don't depend on the coordinate system. But um, there won't be 21 independent constants anymore. Because if there were 21 independent constants, it would be really strange that after rotation, the components don't change. So you have to satisfy some conditions in order so that after you rotate, the components do not change anymore. So for stress and strain, these conditions were derived. Uh, and it ends up being that the only two independent conditions we have, independent constants we have, are Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio new. These two together can be used to form the shear modulus sometimes called modulus of rigidity G, and G is given by E over 2 over 1 plus nu. Young's modulus does not define stress in terms of strain. It actually defines strain in terms of stress. So what Young the modulus says is that if you apply a stress in a certain direction, the strain in that direction will be the value of the stress divided by Young's modulus. So what we have is epsilon x, if I apply sigma x, is going to be sigma x over e. Poisson's effect says that if we apply a stress sigma x, so if we apply, let's say, tension in x direction, then the material is going to contract in y and z. And the ratio between the strain in y and z, which is always, of course, negative in this case, to the strain in x direction is Poisson's ratio. And as such, due to the application of sigma x, we would have sigma y, epsilon y equals minus u sigma x over e, and epsilon z equals minus u sigma x over e. Plus, we can add the contribution from sigma y and sigma z. Of course, sigma y here will give us minus u sigma y over e. This will give us sigma y over e. And this will give us minus u sigma y over e, and then sigma z will give us Poisson contributions sorry, to x and y, and direct contribution to strain in, in z. So what we say is that for an isotropic material, normal strains, so changes in length along the coordinate axis, can only be caused by normal stresses. The shear stresses are defined in terms of the shear modulus, which is analogous to Young's modulus, which is simply the ratio of the corresponding shear stress to 
divided by the shear modulus. So gamma yz is tau yz over g. Gamma zx is equal to tau zx over g. And gamma xy is equal to tau xy over g. But again, these three constants that appear are not independent because of the relationship between the shear modulus, Young's modulus, and Poisson's ratio. And this relationship is a consequence of the constraints on the constants due to the fact that when we rotate the axes, we have to remain the same. Okay, very well. Can we simplify any further? We can actually simplify further in a special case, which is very important for us in, in practice. And that special case is what we call plane stress. Usually in aerospace, we are interested in thin walled structures. And thin walled structures have a certain dimension, which is the thickness direction. So let's say that you have a part of the wing like this, and it extends in this direction. This is chord direction. And this is span direction. Then if you look through the thickness here, you will find that the dimensions of the body in the thickness direction are much smaller than the dimensions along the cord and span. Because we use plate-like structures and chill-like structures, which are very thin. In this case, it is appropriate to assume that the only stresses that act on the body act in the plane tangent to the surface of the body. So if you have a, if you locally attach a set of axes, one of them along the cord, this is called that X, one of them along the span, this is called this Y, one of them in the thickness direction, this is called this Z, then we know that only stresses in the plane x, y are important. So we're talking about sigma z being 0, tau x, z being 0, and tau y, z being 0. While sigma x, sigma y, and tau x, y are not necessarily 0. OK, so because of the relationship between shear strains and shear stresses, we can from here calculate that gamma xz is tau xz over z, which is zero, and tau yz, sorry, and gamma yz is tau yz over z, which is again zero. So zero shear stresses would mean zero shear strain. Fair enough. But what about the condition sigma z equals zero? If you go back to the previous uh, page, you will see here that sigma z epsilon z and sigma z are not independent from the rest of normal stresses sigma x and sigma y in the sense that if you set sigma z equal to zero but sigma x and sigma y are not zero then epsilon z is not necessarily zero 
So what this means is that under plain stress conditions, there will be some contraction or expansion in the thickness direction. And that expansion or contraction can be calculated if we know the in-plane, if we know the in-plane stresses. And if we look at epsilon x and epsilon y, we will see that now they are functions only of sigma x and sigma y. So what we can do is we can write the equations for the system in the form epsilon x is equal to sigma x over e minus mu sigma y over e. epsilon y equals minus mu sigma x over e plus sigma y over e and gamma xy equals tau xy over g. And this would look like a relationship between three strains and three stresses which is nice, which now it's as if we are living completely in the plane and we don't have to worry about anything out of the plane. The only spoiler there is that epsilon z is not necessarily zero. Is not necessarily zero. Okay. Of course, we usually need the relationship between stress and strain. So we would prefer in many cases to express strain, stresses as functions of strain and not strains as functions of stresses. This can be easily done by inverting the relationship given here. So if we invert this relationship, we can find the relationship between stress and strain. And this can be written in matrix form in the following way. Epsilon x, epsilon y, Very well. What about strain energy expression for plane stress? We have derived the principle of minimum total potential and strain energy and everything from the principle of virtual work. And the virtual work done by the internal forces was negative integration over the body, sigma x delta epsilon x plus sigma y delta epsilon y. I'm going to start with tau xy delta gamma xy plus we can add to that the out of plane stresses or stress contributions so we we'll get sigma z delta epsilon z plus tau yz delta gamma yz plus tau zx delta gamma zx volume. So the nice thing about this is since sigma z is zero, tau y z is zero, and tau z x is zero, because we're dealing with plane stress, 
then although delta epsilon z is not zero, all the out of plane terms disappear. So we end up with W internal equals And this is the virtual work by internal forces in the case of clean stress. This is very nice. Now we can move on to strain energy by equating this to minus integration delta Fc d volume over the body. And this tells us that delta Fc is sigma x, delta epsilon x, sigma y delta epsilon y, tau xy delta gamma xy. And from there, and with the previous stress-strain relationship, it is not difficult to see that C will be equal to to be integration over volume. E over 1 minus mu squared times epsilon x squared plus epsilon y squared plus 2 nu epsilon x epsilon y plus 1 minus mu over 2 gamma xy squared e volume. And as we're going to see, this final equation here will have really a lot of applications in the case of in the case of plates and and shells. Because this is where we're heading, is that instead of dealing with three dimensional bodies, we'll try to reduce everything to a state of plane stress by making some assumptions and then we end up with at most two dimensional equations where everything varies only in a plane or on the surface for plates and shells or along a certain beam axis in the case in the case of these.